Hey traders, welcome to the Sunday Notes live show. Great to see everybody. We're going to be together here for the next uh, 30 minutes. We're going to take a look at some of the points from the notes. There's not a lot of, you know, I don't want the notes to be this big, overwhelming uh, read that you have to go through, especially when most of what we're doing remains pretty much uh, what we've been focusing on for the past couple of months at this point. And I think the most important point in the notes, if you want to take a quick look, and I did send them out as an alert to the options room, futures room, and of course, the sector secrets mastery, it's down at the bottom in a yellowish color. And that and that is the section that is the sectors on the radar. Check that out. That's going to be where you want to focus on your multi charts, your relative outperformance. And, and that's where I'll be focusing on to build the next set of trades. Now, right now, we've got a pretty full book, and I'm sure we'll get some of those questions here uh, in the show. Everything from short bonds to short euro to uh, long Freeport Macmoran. I mean, we've got a, we've got a pretty varied and, and pretty busy book, book of trades right now. So I'm going to start having to realize two things. One, we've got to hit some T1s. We can open up some fresh lots. Meaning I think about putting the best nine. I don't ever really want more than about nine positions based on risk and, and based on discernment of the very best positions, the very best setups that we can absolutely put uh, some capital behind, right? We always want to think twice before putting our capital in harm's way. So that's where we sit at the moment in terms of a pretty full book of trades and a, a fairly active book in terms of sometimes we're getting in and getting out within a day or two. So it's pretty active in terms of follow through, which suits me fine, allows us to move to break even that much quicker. But that's where we sit right now. So uh, be sure to check those notes at the very bottom. You'll see the on the radar list. And then I've got uh, a main key to the way that I build my watch list that I think will help a lot of you. All right. So let's, uh, well, you know, you know what the deal is. Uh, this show is about your questions. So let's get to it. Kicking it off with Mark. And Mark asks, in addition to risk and position, position size control, what are habits my most profit of my most profitable students? Uh, you know, I, I don't know, you know, other than what the students tell me, I don't know who's profitable or not. But I can I can talk on behalf of myself in terms of when I turn the corner. And beyond the holy grail, which is risk and position sizing, what's the number one habit? Focus on the trends. I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous. Oh my gosh, Rog, you're going to talk about trends again. Focus on the trends. Focus on that relative outperformance uh, tactic, that strategy, and just beat that into the ground. Just, just keep hammering away on that process. And, and don't let folks who say buy the dip is dead or sell the rip is dead because you know what those knuckleheads are going to come around telling you to do now? I promise you, people who a month or two ago were saying buy the dip is dead are going to tell you how to trend follow again. <laughs> that is the nature of the lunacy sometimes in the psychology of the market. So fo they focus on trends, Mark. And even when in the group of trends, is it ever receding pool of opportunity because the structure gets choppy our macroeconomic trends get get kind of wishy-washy. Uh, there are always going to be, there's always going to be something where money is flowing into. Money does not go under the mattress. It will find somewhere to go. And that is, I believe, the most powerful habit we can, we can build. All right. Thank you for the question. Uh, next up, Integral asks, do I sell covered calls in my long-term stock positions? If so, how do you structure the calls? I don't that often. And, and Integral, that's way beyond the time that I've got here to get into that uh, tactic. But in general, um, yeah, I mean, look, if we want to take our longer term positions and we want to generate income, that's fine. I usually don't. And here's why. It's not because it's not a great idea. So let me just say, amazing idea. But you know what, what happens, Integral, for me? I run out of hours in the day. So I'm day trading in the morning. Uh, I may day trade a little bit in the afternoon, especially with some of the tweaks that we've been making to some of the tools, which I cannot wait to show you all at the end of June. So I might be day trading uh, throughout the session here and there. 
definitely with emphasis on the morning. And then I'm looking for my swing trades for the Sector Secrets Master in the afternoon. So in between all that, I'd, I'd like to actually see my husband, maybe work out a little bit uh, during the lunchtime doldrum, just something to get out of the office. And I have found, and this is not ideal, so please, this is not my telling you not to do it. I just run out of hours in the day. That's really what happens. And I find that just energetically and focus-wise, something's got to give and, and income from my portfolio, which is really what that is for me, is just not a priority. Income for my trading is going to far uh, outproduce the time that I spent, um, you know, structuring, uh, as you said, selling covered calls. No harm in doing that whatsoever. I'm actually letting you know what my issue is, and it's an issue of time. So if you've got the time to do it, go for it. I just don't do a lot of it personally. And thanks for the question. All right, next up, um, T seems to be holding its own. Yeah, you know, it's it's been, James, it's been a name, funny enough, in the in the uh, IYZ that's that's been able to been able to hold its own interestingly enough so in terms of most of what we're looking for in the IYZ which is that telecommunications sector looking at the short side looking at a sell the rip if you're looking for a bullish corner of the market T, but please remember in terms of our risk uh, and position sizing, think about what happens when the boat and the tide are out of sync, right? They're just not in sync. So if that's the case, then, you know, make the adjustment in the sizing, but valid on a pullback. Absolutely. Hey there, Lance. I've, I've begun to integra integrate Darvis boxes into my trading because I show example of its usage in day trading. Lance, I don't do anything. So number one, I use the Darvis 2.0. So if you're using Darvis boxes, please know that my Darvis, the 2.0, is not going to plot exactly like a Darvis, say the one that's built into TOS. So you can grab the 2.0 for free, by the way, over at countdowntrader.com. The, the Darvis is support and resistance. I mean, that's it. So if I'm looking for an example to buy or sell Darvis, as a day trade, the idea is, and, and by the way, I'll be day trading uh, with you all in the futures room and the mastery tomorrow. So you can see some of that, uh, some of that at work, but just briefly, um, Lance, I don't put a lot of, I don't put a lot of emphasis on Darvis in my day trading. The emphasis on day trading is going to be time that day traders clock mentality, volatility. So my HPMRs and overbought, oversold range extremes, exhaustion zones. I would Darvis overlap those zones, then we're in business. But I can't say Darvis take a prominent role in my day trading, but it does give me amazing, clear, process-driven support and resistance uh, on my chart. So that's really all I do. I, I look at it in the context of the, the setups that I'm already looking at, whether that be stochastic and Darvis, that's a great combination, B-score, HPMR, clearing range, uh, breach retreat, and I'll see how Darvis is contributing to the clarity. So thanks for the question. All right. Uh, next up, uh, 6A looks better than 6C. All right. Now, remember, we're already in 6C. So if something starts to look better later, you know, obviously we might know now more than we did then, um, is, is 6C was there first group. So that's why uh, that's a part of my book at the moment. Uh, 6A is there now as of, uh, you know, recently, Friday. Uh, and I agree with you. It doesn't look bad at all. But remember, knowing what we knew at the time, I'd still take the 6C. 6A was in the, in the zone. Now, if we want to consider another position of a dollar buy versus the uh, a com doll, a commodity dollar, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, New Zealand dollar. Then we have the, you know, overall, I would say um, that we have, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that we have an overall heavier position that's sort of committed to com dolls. So maybe reduce the size if you're going to take the 6A, which I agree. But if you're going to take the 6A, take perhaps a little bit of smaller size. It's very much rooted in mining gold, dollar strength, Canadian dollars going to be energy uh, and, and 
lumber perhaps a little bit, but not that much influence at the moment and U.S. dollar strength. So not super overlap, but they, but calm dolls do tend to move together. So keep that in mind in terms of the concentration of a sort of singular idea in your book. Cause I've got to remember, I've already got the six E Euro. Now I've got six C. Uh, and then if I add six A and the dollar happens to really sell off, all three of those positions are probably going to get rocked. So now you're starting to see a little bit more concentration than I would usually uh, recommend. Okay. All right. Next up is, let's see, um, from a UUP standpoint, sure, let's stick with the uh, currency conversation. From a UUP standpoint, what's the T1 and T2? Emanu, it's an alert that is in the uh, alerts that I send out to all. They include T1. I would highly check that out. T2, I don't have, right? And I think a lot of times, once we hit the first target on a lot of trades, the first question that I get is, okay, Rog, what's second target? Please don't be in a rush. Uh, when you're a trend trader, you really want a far more ambitious, uh, greedy type setup, greedy type trade in the um, in that T2. You really want to be a lot more, a lot more ambitious about how much more the the market could move in your favor. All right. And bear with me here. Okay, hang on, get uh, Darvis. Oh, <laughs> Lorna was teasing. What Darvis is not your favorite? <laughs> so yeah, back to that Darvis question. Remember, gang, they're all giving me information. I think a lot of times. Traders think that maybe Darvis is a strategy more than it is an indicator automating support and resistance. It is most definitely the latter. It's a it's a it's automating support and resistance. It's giving us a process by which a it it cuts time and b it increases accuracy and 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 those two things uh, are definitely worth it. But you'll notice almost everything that I do is automated in, in some form or fashion. So I do love the Darvis, but I don't put that much weight on it in day trading. And in fact, it doesn't get that much weight alone. It's always one, you always want to have multiple reasons why a particular zone or a particular level are important. You always want to have a lot of whys. Why could this be support? Why would the buyers want to be here? You know, why is that a, a level that will grab attention? So I think the more whys you have, the better. And clearly, Darvis is a fantastic why. So yeah, the bot saying, wait a minute, Darvis is my favorite, you know? <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so as far as as far as the uh UUP or the the dollar trade goes, uh you man, you yeah, check out the alert, the targets in the room, as it is with any trade that I send out. So thanks for the question. Is there ever a scenario where I exercise an option? Eric, I will from time to time, but not normally. Is there a scenario? Sure. I mean, if I want the, if I want the underlying stock because I just have this gorgeous price. Uh, what's the last time we did that? Oh, but uh, we did UNG, right? UNG was probably the last time that I did that. We had a crazy, uh, I want to say 20... 20 strike, 21 strike on UNG and, and, but it doesn't happen very often. So that was probably the most recent. And as far as this year, Starbucks, I had last year, Starbucks is when I did last year or early this year, but no, I don't make a habit of it. I, and, and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you what, Eric, uh, Starbucks was a great, uh, example of oh there were the 15 calls oh that's right there were the 15 strike one five and we exercised those starbucks was inadvertent uh starbucks was was just i got the shares and i really didn't want them but that was fine so that was one inadvertent and and one purposeful with with ung so not very often at all uh okay next up this week the fomc minutes are coming out you are right my friend how do we position from a risk management standpoint uh, in our positions on SSM, follow the 
Follow the process, my friend. We're not going to do anything different for FOMC. We're not going to do anything different uh, in terms of position sizing or risk. What I will say is we might use that hot zone as a catalyst for more uh, entries, right? We might use the aftermath, the volatility that comes after that hot zone, a scheduled high impact, high volatility event. So we'll use the volatility. And, and for a lot of traders, I'd like to remind them, hey, if you're sitting on a nice unrealized profit and you want to scale out and move to a break even or a trailing, th those are course or things we could do. So from a risk management standpoint, the best thing we can do is not engage uh, right, a, a trade right in front of the release. From a risk management standpoint, the best thing we can do is take advantage of the aftermath. So that's usually what we do. And, and, and I think this week will be no exception, friend. We'll, we'll continue to do that. All right. Uh, is TLT linked to interest rates in any way? Uh, yes, it's the, it is the 30 year. It's a long bond. So, of course, it is an interest rate product that is it is tethered to the ZB long bond. So, yes, it, whatever ZB that 30 year futures contract is doing, you're going to see filter into TLT. So, of course, yes, absolutely. It's the it's the ETF for that long bond. All right, next up, how often do I day trade? How often do I swing trade? I try to I try to look for day trades every day. I have my favorite days. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday usually end up being my favorite. Monday would be my next favorite. And Friday is kind of me because I like to remind everybody, uh, Friday hates traders, <laughs> which is just a reminder that the end of anything, the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, the end of the quarter, the end of the year, is a very different psychology and often more difficult to trade than the beginning of all those things. But I try to find a day trade every morning, Mr. Walker. It's it's not something I shut on and off unless we have a caution day. If we have FOMC, we have Powell, those things might have me either choose not to day trade, so a caution day might keep me on the sidelines, or I'll trade more conservatively with smaller size. But I, but I have... Uh, am, ambition to, to day trade as often as you know the market is open, you know, in the morning. So our swing trade when the setups come, right? We can't, gang, we can't force the market to our levels. Um, one of the reasons I think momentum trading is so popular amongst most traders and investors is it gives those traders and investors plenty of opportunity. Every new high, every bullish surge is is another reason a momentum trader can consider. An entry for exhaustion traders, for pullback or retracement traders like myself, and, and what I teach in the Sector Secrets Mastery, where where our windows are by design far smaller, limited. It prevents overtrading. It prevents chasing. Uh, it it does all it does all the things that I think good traders do, which is frankly trade less. Right? We have we we have this concept of for anything, a minimum effective dose that might be for exercise, that might be for nutrition or supplement, supplementation or something. I, I want to find that minimum effective dose for trading. I don't believe overtrading leads to anything positive. And so I'd rather build the habits that map to less trading. So um, whenever whenever the setups come, um, we swing trade. There's no, there's no way that I could say we're going to have five swing trades this week because I don't tell the market what it's going to do. However, I will also say in the style of our pullback trend following, you'll notice both entries and exits tend to come in clumps. We'll be sort of uh, maybe quiet, and then we get a lot of opportunity or a decent amount of opportunity. Be quiet again, then we get another group of opportunities. So things tend to come in these groups and clumps. Uh, Comcast is the best double red short candidate. Oh, is Comcast the best double red short candidate in the, uh, bear with me here. There we go. In the XLC. All right, let's take a look. XLC. I just finished updating the multi charts today. Absolutely the best way to understand what's happening within a sector, within an index, uh, all free Indicators that I make available to members allow you to build this multi-chart, which is a flexible grid within TOS. There's nothing you need to go buy. You just need to build a multi-chart that visually is comfortable for you. This is my multi-chart. So I can take a look at the trade flags and in a very, very quick 
glance, I know where the double reds are. So the question is, is Comcast the best? I think it has good company. Comcast, Match, WBD, those catch my eye because they're lower cost. Goo Goo Gal, Charter, those are also double reds, a little higher cost, higher cost for the option, higher cost basis, and more risk associated with movement in those options. The aforementioned T is also in the XLC. That's in an uptrend. So is it the best? I would say keep an eye on Comcast, Match, and WBD. I would keep an eye on, on all three of those. I'd say they're they're pretty much even. All right? So thanks for the question. An awesome, awesome job at, at uh, looking at the relative outperformance with the multi-chart and finding what the weakest names are. I don't think this is a difficult uh, part of trading, but I think oftentimes it's an overlooked part of trading, right? I think a lot of traders get frustrated because they don't have a process to take a huge sea of stocks, say in a sector or an index and find the two or three, like we just did in what, about 15 seconds, right? Have a easy way to whittle down to the best examples. I don't think they have a great way necessarily of always finding where the outperformance is. Once again, with the grab candles and the JT multi, boom, that's how easy it is to find the relative outperformance. Relative to what? Relative to the singular uh, ETF and, and the theme of communications, these stocks that are tethered together because they're all weighted within this uh, one ETF. And by the way, you really don't want to curate your own lists of stocks because they may not be moving together. These are very likely to move together. These meaning stocks that are weighted heavily within the ETF. So this is how you want to be able to understand, well, look, look at the two approaches within XLC. I'm not going to treat T the way that I'm going to treat MTCH, right? I'm not going to treat T the way that I'm going to treat VZ. And VZ, oh, by the way, I do have a position in VZ, although it's gone yellow. I'm not going to treat VZ the way that I'm going to treat Comcast if I'm looking at this with fresh eyes. So that's how easy it is to know what your approach could be. It just doesn't get any easier than that. So thank you for the question. Good stuff. All right. Next up is, um, let's see, he asked, uh, do I let an option go to expiration as long as it's still valid or do you sometimes take profit earlier? I do not want an option going to expiration. No, because once it goes there, you know, it's, it's done. It's expired. It's worthless, right? So we want to be out ahead of expiration. Most of the time we are. Uh, I like to think about exiting. Let's say we have a trend that's really going in our favor. I like to be out at least a day before options expiration or the week of options expiration. Uh, so yeah, we we make a habit of taking profits early all the time. I never want to let an option go to expiration because we're always long calls and long puts. Letting an option go to expiration is something that traders who are selling premium want to do because they're going to profit when that uh, premium that they sold goes to no value. So no, as long call or debit, directional debit traders, which is what I specialize in. No, we never want to do that. Yee -yee. And thank you for the question. Important question. That's, that's It's unique to what I do because I do not write premium. We do not trade spreads. We don't use multi-leg strategies. What I, what I teach is long calls, long puts, cash account, budget friendly. And then we build our foundation from there. All right. Cool. Next up, um, if we have to consider re-entering some of the prior short positions, such as uh, Starbucks or Nike, we don't have to do anything, right? Um, but if we're going to, uh, what should we wait to do? Sell the rip. Well, look at start with its structure. Start with the structure, right? Um, in this case, XLY is in a downtrend. Great. Starbucks is in a downtrend. Awesome. So if it's double red, here's your relative performance. Um, if it's double red, what do I what do I not want to short? TJ Maxx, probably not booking. I'll be I'll be a little bit more cautious with Home Depot because while it's going lower, there are other stocks in ITV XHB that look better than Home Depot. I think low is one of them. McDonald's, I don't want. Boom, right there. If you're ever overwhelmed with so many names, look how quickly. Whoosh, 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 
four stocks gone, right? Four stocks gone. So right there, that's how we do it. The next thing that we want to keep in mind is, all right, affordability. Uh, Starbucks, the name that you mentioned, Nike, um, those are all relatively affordable corners of the consumer discretionary group. Uh, GM would be another. And let's see what else we have here. Yeah, everything else gets a little spendy. So I like where you're looking. And then, yeah, we're going to short the rip. Uh, that would be what we would look to set up. All right. Um, what are my thoughts on Citi and JP Morgan? You know what? Let's jump on over to XLF to answer that question. We'll take a look at the multi chart of the financials. So, Matt, what are my thoughts on Citi? Well, we're in it. So my thoughts are, I hope it goes down. <laughs> That's the path of least resistance, right? I'm only, only kidding a little bit. I don't, I don't hope for anything. I don't hope or wish. That's for birthday cakes. This is a trend. My expectation is the probability will send it lower. JP Morgan, ditto. Look, everything but Chubb is double red. The individual boats, all of them except for Chubb, double red. The, the tide itself, double red. There's, no, there's not a lot of reason to necessarily have to go to an individual stock if XLF bounces and give us an opportunity to play the tide. And unless that happens, then I'll have to go to the individual boats, which is what we've done so far. But there is not a lot here that is not in a beautiful downtrend where we would absolutely short the rip. Yeah, so that's exact. Absolutely. Anywhere you see all this red, Matt, red grab candles, the red JT multi or the trade flags, yeah, whichever version you've got, if you've got the multi-trend, great, use that. If you've got the trade flags that I make available to everybody, use that. But when you see red, red, and the red grab candles, and the red boats, and the red tide, absolutely, absolutely. All right, um, next up is, hey there, Terry, MU. You know, you know what made me happy about MU? Well, first of all, I was unhappy because it took the scenic route to the downside. I was exceedingly happy because this was one of the trades that I was able to alert to the options room, the futures room, and the sector secrets mastery because we did that Friday session, Friday before last. So everybody got to get in on this, which makes me so happy. And it did work out great. But why did it? Because a general trend of MU continues to head lower. It was, it did rally with AMD and SMH for a minute, but trust the trend that was. If you have a downtrend and we get a little bit of a neutral market, that's okay. You know, just stick with that, stick with that trend, manage your risk. And yeah, MU worked out really well for us. All right. So what is my futures? What is the futures day trading room? There's no futures day trading room per se, Javier. We have a day trading room. I am not a part of that though. Uh, we have a day trading room uh, and we have the futures room. We do a lot of day trading in both. Uh, rooms. I'm in the futures room, of course. I'm in my mastery. For me, my my personal schedule is two hours in the morning, and and I'm in the I'm in various rooms doing that from time to time. I'm hoping to to update that schedule a little bit more after my day trading class at the end of June. So if you've been wanting to learn more about my day trading, if you want to learn more about the clock and volatility and the things that I've been talking about here in charts and coffee, and also in the the free videos over at the Simpler Trading YouTube channel. That is happening June 25. And, and of course, we'll have a webinar uh, and I'll explain what I'm doing and, and, and why time and volatility have been so useful this year. But uh, am I personally active until the close? Day trading? No, I don't day trade all day long. So if there's two windows for me, 9.30 to 11.30 and about 1.30 to 3.30, 3.45 Eastern. That's what I personally focus on. All right. Um, so next up is why 6610 on, on that exit. 6610. I, I was stepping out in front of the Darvis. I don't use ATR, Terry. I don't use ATR at all. Um, I just stepped out in front of the Darvis. Look, look, I mean, look, sometimes we get so cute. Sometimes you can get too cute with our indicators. I always ask myself that when I when I look at all my secret squiggles. Rog, do you really need to look at the the uh, V score of the V of the VWAP? Do you really need to look at all these moving averages? I always run myself through that question. Rog, does the world need another secret squiggle? So I try to keep things pretty simple. 
And and that one was just stepping out in front of the Darvis. Uh, Terry, I, and I do not use ATR. Uh, VLO, sure. Uh, touch the 21. It sure did. It sure did. Agro buy is, is valid. Agro buy is valid. Uh, and then we have gold. Gold. Oh, so gold is in a downtrend. And yep, gold is hitting the 200. Gold is hitting the 21. This is looking like a short. This is looking like a short. As long as real yields continue to go down, uh, gold is going to move higher. So what we want really want to see is real yields start to move back up and then that's going to keep gold below the wave below the 200 and that is what we will be focusing on so that's definitely on the that's definitely on the uh, radar yeah going forward yeah that's definitely on the radar okay gang and gosh that 30 minutes flies by so fast thank you as always for being a part of the of our of our weekly notes show, uh, you know, I I'm always just so impressed that a lot of you like myself are preparing for the week uh, on a Sunday evening. The markets are open. Get a quick first look at what's going on. Go enjoy some dinner, and then now we're a little bit better prepared for the week ahead. And uh, so I, again, tip my hat, admire all your dedication and questions. I appreciate the time as always. Have a great rest of your weekend. I'll see you all tomorrow morning. 9 a.m. for Charts and Coffee right here at the Simpler Trading YouTube channel. All right, gang, be good to each other.